You're listening to the Elephant in the Room property podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. In recent years, there's been quite a lot of talk about the future of work, whether robots will take our jobs and is the era of full-time employment ending? And then with less full-time work on offer, how will people get mortgages and buy a home? We've been seeing a trend of people who actually shun employment. Instead, they form startups, small consultancies, online retailing, you name it, no longer setting up in their spare room or garage, but taking advantage of the recent proliferation of co-working spaces. And now there's a bunch of people saying that we're going to start living in a similar way, and it's called co-living. So what is co-living? Is it something that only millennials will be interested in? Is it something to consider investing in? Well, in this episode, we pick the brains of Ed Fernan, CEO of a company called Yuko, a co-living company. Ed's property journey started in 2013 when he started taking up options on properties to develop and putting together creative deals. And along the way, he began to see a lot of opportunity in the new generation boarding house space and started to investigate co-living as a way to drive additional revenue while creating positive social benefits. Ed met with the founders of Yuko in mid-2018 and was immediately impressed by their vision, which matched his own belief that co-living had huge growth potential and there was a real need in the community. Not long after that, he became the CEO and he's been busy improving the model and expanding the business. And just as an aside, Ed also competed for Australia at the 2012 London Olympic Games in modern pentathlon and is a 2017 winner and record holder of the Mongol Derby, the world's longest horse race. So thank you for joining us, Ed. Uh, thanks for having me. Very excited. Thank you, Ed. Um, I've been wanting to talk about this topic, well, since the start of the podcast because yes. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. But before we go there, I mean, Mongol Rally uh, Derby, what is that? <laughs> yeah, so the Mongol Derby, I mean, a lot of people uh, really like to talk about this because it's it's just crazy. It's it's absolutely nuts. Yeah. Um, it's it's the longest horse race in the world. It's mm. a, over a thousand kilometer horse race through Mongolia. Right. Uh, it's based on Genghis Khan's postal system. So Genghis Khan set up the first postal system in the world, okay. where they used to have horse stations. So you'd have a rider gets on a horse, rides thirty forty kilometers, then gets on another horse, and that's how they were able to right. communicate through their empire. And this so same rider, different horses. Same rider, so different just, horses. So we rode. You the horse, get yes. another horse. Right, okay. Yes, I mean, <laughs> now it's a bit different because we've got uh, vet checks along the way, but we ride 28 different horses over 1,000 kilometres. Um, it's a, a generally a 10-day race. Um, and uh, we were riding, you know, up to 180 k's on one of the days during the race and got a very sore bum by the oh, end, I can tell you. Wow. <laughs> How many people yeah. competed in that? So there was 42 starters from around the world, wow. um, people from all different uh, equestrian backgrounds, yep. a lot of endurance riders, um, very top horsemen, and all come together in Mongolia. And, and uh, it's, it's more than just being a, a good horseman because um, yep. you ride the Mongolian ponies, which, as people probably don't know, they're, they're wild, um, basically untamed horses that get herded. They still... So it's People like there. riding Brumbies. Yeah, effectively, yeah. And they, yeah, they, they well. bring them in and they bark and carry on. Everyone falls off. Everyone um, yeah. everyone goes uh, a bit crazy. But um, <laughs> you get on and you, you go. And, and yeah. then each night at, at uh, 8 o'clock each night, you've got to stop. And gotcha. wherever you are in Mongolia, you've got to stop and you've got a GPS on and you just camp wherever you are. So you might be staying with a local Mongolian family who don't even know you're turning up and wow. you're, you're camping out and you're hobbling your horse. And so... Great fun, great challenge, and, uh, yeah, something I'm very proud of. So is that where you got the idea for co-living in Mongolia? <laughs> <laughs> well, they certainly have some aspects of co-living in Mongolia, the, the way their <laughs> traditional way of life. But in all seriousness, effectively, co-living we don't see as a new way of life at all. Yes. Um, it's a way of how communities have always been from the beginning of time, living that traditional way of life in a community. We are uh, relationship-based people. We're emotional creatures. 
and the way we interact, we want people around us. And mm. so over time, I think with urbanization, population growth and the development controls, it's all about how we fit more and more people and how we just increase density, not really thinking about the way people live in these places. Yep. Um, it's just about building mass scale. So what we're trying to do is bring that back, think about planning, think about the way people are living and come back to that traditional way of life, you know, from the beginning of time, which is community-based living. Okay. So UKO, um, UKO, what's the kind of, what's the future of that business and where do you see the future of kind of co-living in Australia more broadly? So I think co-living has been incredibly successful overseas. We've seen it across Europe um, across the states, there's a number of very large scale operators. Even Medici in uh, in Europe and yep. Germany, they raised one and a half billion dollars to to launch co living worldwide. And, and I guess they're trying to become the the we work of co living. Yep. Um, so we think we're a bit late to the the party here in Australia. But saying that, we think Australia is probably the best market in the world for co living. You've got the second most unaffordable housing in the world after Hong Kong. You've got no traditional build to rent in Australia and you've got a lot of limitations with that traditional build to rent. Um, and there's another, a lot of social issues and, and changing in, in demographics in Australia as well, which is leading to, to co-living being a really important, um, you know, important way for, for people to transition in their lives. And I mean, we mostly target the millennial market, uh, but we see an incredibly uh, great potential in being able to scale this across Australia. So, and, and focusing on, continuing to focus on millennials, or are you thinking that, well, there may be other demographics that, that fit this model? Yeah, well, absolutely. Many demographics fit this model. And I think traditionally our, our market when we came to it was thinking about the 25 to 35 year age group. So yeah. people that have just finished uni, young professionals getting into the, the workforce and, and, and coming in there. But what we've actually experienced is that the millennial mindset is it, it is a mindset. It's not just a age bracket. Mm. Yeah. So we've seen people who have been in their sixties and in their fifties come and stay with us. Yeah. And, uh, and have joined. Like we had one guy who turned up and he was there, and he we have community dinners regularly, and where the the residents come and all eat together, and it's a fantastic way for people to meet each other. And uh, this guy brought his his parents along, and and then his parents were like, can we move in? And <laughs> so they they moved yep. in, and oh, cool. it, it was great. So we are seeing. Um, I think a, a change in, in the way people are approaching it and we're seeing a different demographics coming in as well. But I think traditionally, yes, it will always be that 25, 35 age group, but we are seeing that great expansion as well. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah I mean, that age group are already probably co-living. A lot of them, they're just going to the mates. pain of <laughs> getting a lease, you know, finding their three or four mates. They go and sign the lease. They yeah. get the furniture out. They, you yeah. know, someone agrees to take the phone, you know, and gets the electricity. Someone agrees to do the shopping and, and it's that's kind of yeah, and that's exactly right. You look at co-living. What we're trying to do is sort of two parts. One is create community. So the first aspect of that is that you've got a situation in Australia where you, you've got uh, one in five Australians will suffer a mental health yeah. illness in a given year. You've got a major loneliness epidemic. Even yeah. in the, the UK now, they've got a minister for loneliness. Um, yeah. You've got twenty six percent of households are actually single person households. Mm -hmm. And with singles and couples are making up over 50% now. So you've got a situation where people are becoming isolated mm. and, and the quality of people's mental health is largely driven by the quality of people's relationships. Yep. So, you know, when people are in these apartment blocks and they don't know anyone and they're isolated, that's going to affect them. So we're very much on community living, re building relationships. And then the second part of what we're doing and our point of difference is what you just touched on then was it is very, very difficult for tenants in this market to, to actually go out and get a lease. Mm. It's very unflexible. You, you've got most of the stock in Australia is actually mum and dad landlords. And if just put yourself in the position of being a tenant today, wanting to go out and get a lease, you've got to go and inspect the property on a Saturday, find out when it's open. You've got four properties on at the same time to inspect. Then you've got to put your application in, takes weeks. Then you've got to find the money for a bond, then you're successful, do your references, go and get furniture, pay for the furniture. Then you're on the phone to Sydney Water or another electricity yep. provider, your internet, all of these things. It's so tough for people. Yep. What we try and do is complete hassle-free 
city living. It's it's complete flexibility. You determine how long you want to stay. The longer you stay, the less you pay. All included furniture. Um, we've got very uh, creative furniture that we've developed. Um, and, yeah. and it's, I've it's looked on your amazing. website. Yeah. It does look pretty creative, <laughs> like beds on top of yeah. wardrobes and things like that. That's so right. You're maximising space. Right. But all inclusive utilities as well. So it's just about making it easy for people, and yep. people want that flexibility. And interestingly enough, though, there's a point at which some people, and we've interviewed a lot of people around, you know, the point at which they say that I want security and they want stability and all that sort of stuff. And so I guess you know, that may not be provided by this sort of living, you know, because they don't own it, they can't change the paint, they can't furnish it, they can't, you know what I mean? Like, so I guess there's, maybe that's the next generation of communal living. But but what is the actual, what's the difference, say, between, you know, moving into a communal living such as UCO versus, by, you know, renting a studio apartment somewhere? Oh, w- huge differences. Good, one, tell us. One, one, one is that <laughs> mm. you're moving into a studio apartment and then you've got to go furnish that apartment. There's no community aspect of that. You've got to organise the utilities and yeah. all of those things. So, but Tell me but, about but, the community side, though. That's, that's really yeah, what so I'm interested all, in. All of our properties are hosted. We mm. have a community host. It's sort of like a mother hen, someone who's looking out for the residents in all the properties. We get to know the residents really well and then they facilitate the community dinners that we have. We have yoga at the properties. We have movie nights. Um, they organise trivia often at the local pubs once a week uh, and different um, events during the year. And what that's about, firstly for us, it's about generating relationships with the people. Because as soon as you develop relationships between your hosts and between your different residents, the yep. social issues go away. Mm. Yep. Any issues, because you've got the relationship, it just dissipate. You can always talk to people and people. Res- there's a gener- general respect that is, is created. There was a host, so- a counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's part of their job. Mm. But, yeah, they're in the common room um, and a, 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 a huge part of it, it all comes down to that community um, common room and community area so people can, can facilitate. And so, the, and yeah, their living there. space is it's very separate. much. Yeah. So I, I think that's probably a good good way. We're using mm. the new generation boarding house set. So effectively they're anywhere roughly around 24 square metre studios, all self-contained. They've yep. got a kitchenette. They've got an ensuite bathroom. They've got a double bed. They've got joinery, and, and we do a lot on the joinery to improve their space so that they can fit all their, their things in. And then they've got a big common area, which they can cook in. That's got a big oven. They can have dinner parties there if they want. They, they can use that additional fridge space, freezer space, um, an area where they can relax. Um, there's outdoor areas as well that they can in, in, enjoy. So I guess people are paying for uh, separating from – not only a studio, but say a one or two better, where they're giving up that for coming in for a smaller private space, but more more communal spaces and getting mm. that access yep. to that. And and people are really enjoying that trade off. So I mean, I guess I, I work in co working spaces and I have done for five years, and yes. their perception has changed over the years as they've got better, right? You know, and like the same with co living. I think you know, version one is X, version yep. two, the only way to get you know either to charge more. It's charge more, you've got to have more services, right? Correct. Or if someone else wants to disrupt disrupt your op- option, they're going to try to undercut you on price, but, you know, can they do it profitably, et cetera? So, you know, co-living, I think, over over the coming years will get better and better. And, you know, I do think that, you know, a lot of people will, will think just getting a studio apartment will just be so much pain and effort, mm. but what am I getting for it? Mm. If I can move into a co-living space for this and get even more benefits and less risk and less money, et cetera, yep. um, you know, I can't see it kind of stopping, but a lot of co-living, you know, you don't want to live in kind of high rise areas. They want to live in more established areas. So I can see that that's kind of more of a strategy for you guys. You're going into more kind of, you know, established kind of family areas like Paddington and Stanmore rather than kind of high rise areas. Yeah. Well, I think for us, when we're looking at property, the big thing for us is amenity and that walkability index. We want to be near, uh, the train stations, yeah. public transport. We want to make sure that we're we're close to um, infrastructure. Like, where's the nearest hospital? Where's the nearest uh, university? Where's the commercial hubs? Where are people going to work? Uh, a, a big part of it as well is how far away are we from the nearest gym? Where are people going to get their coffee in the morning? Mm. Um, wh- where's the supermarket? Yep. All of those things are really important to us. So, uh, unlike student accommodation, which are all just looking at universities. Mm. Um, and I think that market will slowly become saturated. 
particularly with the big players. You've, you've seen Urban Nest and Igloo yeah. and these groups get very aggressive scape as well. And that, yes, the student market is increasing, but we don't have those limitations. We take anyone. We're not about students at all. We're, mm. we're very yeah. much open. And our locations, we can go anywhere. Provided that we've got that those solid metrics where people want to live in the amenity, then then the you know the sky's the limit in in the uh, you know options for us of, of where we can go and probably the more tier three locations so outer ring, ring fringe locations will probably do smaller scale sites more inner city locations where we know there's high demand you know, we'll do 150 plus rooms so we can do bigger scale areas and and then when we've got those bigger scales we're also looking for adding additional amenity making sure that we're still keeping that quality community feel in that's those buildings. I was going to say, because the bigger you get, the less community you sometimes mm. get yes. as yeah. well, because it's Correct. kind of counterintuitive. You know, yep. you just see someone coming and going, you don't know who they are, so you don't make an effort. Yep. But if there's only 12 or 20, you know. That's where you create micro communities within yeah. a larger building. And you, that, that that's fundamental to what we do. Community mm. living is, is the fundamental part. So you've got to do creative design in, in the larger scale ones to ensure you're still delivering on the community aspect. Now, the money side of things. Yes. Because obviously, um, you know, you're investing in it. So well, I guess how's UCO funded? Yes. Like do you have investors invest in your business? I mean, in terms of the future of this for property investors, for instance, what sort of opportunities will come from that? And then I want to get to the actual numbers. If I, I don't want your numbers, but I'm interested sure. to know how it becomes profitable. Yeah, well, I mean, we're primarily a lease business. We do own a number of sites and we've, to do uh, developments ourselves, but primarily we're a leasehold business. Mm. So we're working with developers every day of the week who have got sites, primarily new generation boarding houses, and they're thinking for them, what's their opportunity cost? And that is to rent them by the room through a local agent who doesn't understand co-living. You potentially have those social yes. uh, impacts. And uh, I think there is still a really negative stigma around boarding houses. 100%. Um, oh, very much and, so. <laughs> and I think one of the huge mistakes of the New South Wales government was actually calling the 2009 affordable housing the new generation boarding house set. The new generation boarding house set. Because mm. really what it is, it's, it's for us particularly, we just talk about co-living. Mm. And uh, it's very similar to the micro apartments that they've done in New York. And uh, it, it's just micro living. Mm. And so for us, definitely it's about working with local developers who have got these sites, um, putting a head lease in place, managing them better, and, and we're able to generate a high yield and a high return for the owners because we're able to uh, develop and give offer all these additional services for our for our residents. And what sort of lease do you are you taking out on these properties? Um, it varies. So we, we like having uh, options up to 30 years, mm. but, um, you know, initial term five years and, and, and we extend. I mean, in... We started with a business called uh, Furnished Property 17 years ago. The founders, Alex and Reese, uh, out of uni, were uh, leasing properties, um, furnishing those, and then and then subleasing those properties. And um, well, before Airbnb wow, ever yeah, existed yeah. or was even mm, thought about, yeah. and they really scaled that business up and did tremendously well. And so this has been a, a sort of second version off off that back. So they got tremendous amount of experience. And they've also got the hotel group Veriu and Punt Hill now. So they've got that hotel knowledge and that hospitality knowledge to really ensure that you're delivering on, on what you say you're going to do. It's interesting because, you know, if you are got a property that is suitable for boarding houses and you're not getting the yield because, you know, it's a house or it's a big block of land, yep. then it does make sense to consider transforming that property mm. into co-living or into a boarding house, but then you have all the problems with going down that direction, managing it and all that sort of stuff. So then if you have someone, a partnership with someone like, you know, Uko, then you can basically improve your yield. You still own the same amount of land, so you still get the growth, mm. but you actually increase your yield dramatically yeah. and more likely to sustainable yield if you've got someone managing it. And so this is what, uh, you know, It's also the type of tenant, you know, like, so for instance, if you, your typical boarding house, and I know I'm venturing into dangerous territory here, yeah. <laughs> never having walked in one, I've only ever walked past. Actually, years ago, I did, when I was at uni, I did um, have a look at a bed sit in this hideous building in Balmain that's still there and it's got these horrible little depressing little units in it full of basically old drunks. And, well, mm. once again, I've got to be really careful there. But, but you know, your, your stereotypical boarding house where people who can't afford to live um, 
elsewhere or in a bigger place or in a better place or whatever, and it tends to have the more disadvantaged amongst us living there, which mm. means that from pure investment you're capped in terms of your yield because yep. they can only afford to pay so much rent, particularly if they're on benefits, yes. um, you know, versus refitting or refurbishing. And I know I'm going to get probably some flack for this because I'm thinking <laughs> obviously there's Sept 10, right, where you've got yep. to pre preserve housing for people in need. But, you know, obviously if you've got that type of tenant, you're capped in terms of your yield. But if you did something like this where you invested in the building and all the rest of it, then I would imagine then your yield opportunities really open up because you've got people with higher disposable incomes able to come along and rent it, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. I just, and so you're wading looking, through murky waters there, and, but anyway. The other thing as well, you're looking at some of the worst rental conditions in Sydney like mm. for 15 years right now. Really? You're because at, vacancy rates have gone up. Yeah, exactly. And rents have gone down. Yeah, exactly. So worst, worst rental you mean conditions. From, a, from an investor's point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, right, right. So okay. from an investor's point of view, you've got terrible rental conditions. Mm. People are really struggling. Vacancy rates, as you say, are are, are really high and, and have been um, for you know quite quite a few months and, and year. And, and I, I think there will be a little bit of time to, to amend that. But for, for us, our vacancy rates are incredibly low. Yeah, I was and, and wondering people, about... there's huge demand. We, we just fill up very, very quickly our properties because there's – there is demand for that quality community living. And so it is the convenience and the community that is attracting people to it. Is... Yeah, and the flexibility as mm. well. So, yeah. and, and really it, it is, there's cost savings as a part of that because you, instead of going and renting that one bedroom apartment or whatever, you, you, you're able to get, go to the studio, the, the, mm. the smaller rooms and, and, and then get the benefit of, of the common areas. But coming back to your yield, people in, in Sydney and you look at unit blocks that are trading in the market, uh, even houses that you know looking at three percent yield on some of these cases, yep. interest rates now have dropped to record highs, uh, so record lows. lows of one, you mm. know, one percent, and people are looking for how they get quality yield in in their investments. Yes, um, stock markets at all time highs, and people are questioning whether that's sustainable. Mm. So for us, you know, a lot of these developers are, are, are developing these sites with six to even up to ten percent. Yields, depending on where they're buying raw or DA approved, or and and their bill cost, and yep. and so it's it's great for people, particularly when they've got operators like uh, us. They're having because commercial residential, mm. the benefit of of a commercial lease, all the benefits of the commercial, uh, with an underlying residential property, and the benefits of residential as well, and 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 the compression over time of uh, of residential rates. I noticed the the two sites you've got. You have got one in Stanmore. It's on Princess. It's on uh, Paramount Road. Road. Yes, and you have got one in pa in Paddington on Moore Park Road. Both very busy roads. Yes. So, is that does that keep the cost of the actual property itself down and that make it more um, financially viable? I mean, I don't know. Is um, that coincidence? No, no, probably more so coincidence. Mm. I think busy roads generally um, would probably be better because you, busy roads you're near amenity. They're coming back to you. You know, you do see a lot of those busier roads near the train stations, near the public transport, near mm -hmm. those those areas. So, where for us, you know, the double glazing and the things that we put into the building allow us to to limit the impact of busy roads. Yep. Um, but for us, often those busy roads are around the amenity, which is where we, exactly we want to be. And is that easier probably to get council approval? I imagine you know because you're stepping away from more the. You know the residential, the families kind of battling yeah, out, exactly. stopping it, exactly. rather than on the main road. Yeah. Kind of anything goes a lot of the time. Yeah, <laughs> when we, we don't we don't go in our two zones. Yeah. So uh, the low density residential zones, which some developers have targeted, and you've seen the New South Wales government come out and actually change the SEP and and change um, the guidelines around R two zones to limit that because of of, of feedback and mm. from from communities. And well, I, I agree with that stance that they've taken. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is. Those high residential zones don't have the amenity anyway, so we don't we don't want to be there. So we, we're generally in those R three, R four zones, um, even commercial zones, um, as, as long as it has has the uh, good public transport and good good links there. Yeah, and you said uh, Veronica was saying you know people are going for the amenity and the convenience, but it's mm. not all, it's not for affordable reasons. You know, I'm yeah. sure when you do you look at your incomes, they're not doing it because they haven't can't go afford to rent a one bedroom studio. They're doing yeah. it because they. They get all those other benefits, Correct. and we're not doing affordable housing at all. Yes, um, it's about creating quality rental stock and creating uh, flexibility in the rental accommodation. I mean, the the state government do, do not have a SEP 
for integrated living. I mean, we see there's an, uh, in the future where you're going to have a changes where people can in in single buildings. You've got you know the childcare centres and the gyms and all the amenity in the single buildings, and people can. Uh, they well, don't developers need to. are doing that. Yeah. some of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, mm. that's mm. more and more people are looking looking at yeah, that now, yeah. which is a great idea. But from a planning perspective, you R four, mm. you R three, you B four. Yeah. Like, I mean, mixed use is probably the best op- option to do that in. But there's limited limited uh, opportunities. Yeah, and uh, particularly in R four zones, you've got developers out there that say we don't want to lose our floor space, we don't want to lose our GFA by putting communal area in because that's going to take out an apartment. I mean, one of the benefits of the uh, the boarding house step is it actually mandates that you have to provide the community, which right. is a core part of our business, mm. and that community areas and common areas. So, um, for us, I think what we should be looking at is how we do facilitate more common areas, even in our uh, in, in our R four R three zones and mm-hmm. and and future developments, and how people can interact and create that. Um, that interaction between the residents. I mean, I was wondering, you know, you could probably have them for single parents, you know, and, and Absolutely. like, so then, mm. you know, they got, they can all help each other out with child mining exactly. and stuff and have yep. nights out and, yep. you know, you could, or uh, older singles who are retiring and, and they don't have um, a partner, you know, and yep. so then they've got a whole community that they can start holidaying with. I mean, you can actually see this sort of rolling out into a whole bunch of, um, and I've just picked singles there. I'm sure couples well, are couples in, 100%. in it as well, you yeah. know. So Yeah. I mean, a lot of couples will share with other couples. It's mm. not a craziness. I'm sure there's places in the world where it's always been that way. You know, That's if you've right. got examples of kind of... Well, multi multi-generational living as yeah, well. Yeah, even multi-generational. Mm. Have you got, you know, where around the world are already embracing this en masse? Oh, where are they not? Right. Um, so, yeah, you look across the US, you've got some very big players, um, Common and uh, are a good example. Um, you've got Collective, uh, even WeWork have brought out their We Live brand. Yep. Um, so there's some very big players in the US, um, in in the, the UK as well. There's a number of big players. Uh, Medici and Quarters I talked about earlier. Um, in Hong Kong, you've got Weave Co-Living. They did a large raise um, backed by Walbo Pincus. Uh, so it's uh, it's really good to see that expansion and, and we think, as I said, we're a bit late to the party here and we've Do you got, mean you as in UCO or you mean you as co, Australia? Co-living, as, us as yeah, Australia. Right, yeah, yeah as, mm. as, as Australians and, mm. and uh, we think there's huge opportunity across Australia to deliver that really quality um, that quality housing stock. And mm. are families going into these ones overseas? Like I, I know a lot of, let's say, Europe, Europe kind of, you know, Northern Europe, you know, yep. Sweden, you know, Copenhagen, those sort yes. of, you know. <laughs> Families kind of share, you know, facilities, you know, and it could Correct. be, you know, all the houses don't have like a courtyard, you know, separate little fence. They've kind of got a big open green area and there's yep. the shared barbecue facilities, et cetera. So, you know, is that, have you got examples of where countries around the world are actually families are doing this? Because, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, this is great for singles or, but as soon as kids come along, you're not going to want to do co-living. But yeah, actually, so I think we're starting to get into more multifamily built to rent. Uh, in this conversation, and that's mm. what they're trying to facilitate in those developments. Um, there's a lot of tax issues with build to rent in Australia, which is why it's not taking off. Mm. Um, and I think the the federal and state governments need to look at at those tax uh, issues if if there's going to be a change um, from a, a large scale perspective. But uh, I'll, I'll give you an example in in London, where uh, in Wembley Park, there's there's two properties side by side, and in one, it's it's a build to rent where they've got a lot of this common amenity. They've got a lot of these um, common areas as well for families. And the other one is a traditional unit block where there's rentals in there, but a lot of own occupiers as well. Even on the rental, you're getting a 12.5% premium in the uh, traditional build to rent where they've got that common area yeah. and common amenity over the standard uh, block next door where they have basically got... Um, owner occupiers and and investors in that building. So there's definitely a premium that people attribute to the common amenity and all those things that you've talked about. Uh, and and that's it, built to rent multifamily. Yeah. So we think we're gonna to to do this. The banks are gonna probably have to come on board. It's similar to yep. modular homes. Um, you know, you know, there's a whole amazing opportunity for people to move into building away from old construction techniques where you do the slab, you build it all on site. You've got problems with weather and yeah. Staff, etc., like that. Yeah, why don't build you build a factory and get shipped? Yeah, like, <laughs> and like, why don't you actually do? We could do this better, right? There's more efficient ways to build houses than 
the old way of building houses. But the problem with that is you've got these amazing people who are already doing this, but they can't get bank finance mm. because the bank can't control the build because it's built off site. And if the, the builder goes bankrupt, they will lose all their money. Right. Whereas if the house is built on site, the bank's not as concerned because they can sell the asset like a half finished house. It's pointless anyway. So banks haven't really come on board for modular homes. So yeah. while they could have exploded across the whole country, mm. banks haven't come on board. It's the same thing as these, you know, if, if banks come on board for co-living, they'll have to re change their rules and they'll have to come up with policies. Then investors can go and invest in co-living. And so I think that's going to be a interesting thing yeah. because Investors at the moment, like banks won't want to go anywhere near it. Well, you're locked out of it because unless you can, you can have one of those big sites, you know, you can't really invest in it at the yeah, moment. I mean, Is that correct? I, mean, I think it's an education process. Absolutely. Yes. For, for investors. But saying that, I mean, the banks have come a long, long way in yep. now understanding this asset class. Mm. Like five years ago, as you say, they didn't touch it, didn't want to know about it. And now we're seeing a number of banks. We've got relationships with a number of banks and they're actually calling us to say, hey, this person's walked in the door. Yep. They've got a head lease. Oh, they've got, they've got a property. Could you take a head lease of the property so that that helps our exit? That yep. reduces our risk from a bank perspective. And uh, so that's really good that they're actually turning around and saying, uh, we are interested in the asset class, but if you can come in as the operator, we see that's the major risk and then we, therefore we can work for a win-win situation for the banks, win-win situation for the developers um, and for ourselves in, in building up the model. Yeah, exactly. So like if we could shift, you know, investors that are going and having to buy, you know, bog standard, cheap, boring studio, one mm. bedders, two bedders, we've already got enough of those. And then they could go and buy, you know, in new developments that have got co-living, but they're smaller apartments and they haven't got all the facilities of studios. That's when I think the game will change because you won't have to go to the, on the big end of town, but you know, et cetera. Yeah, but, but how would they buy it? I and mean, would would it, be, would it be a property trust and they'd actually buy shares in that property trust or would they actually go and buy that, you know, would you strata it? I mean, no, that... I mean, these are single title properties. You can't strata them. Mm. Um, yeah. So it's mostly what we're seeing is they're, they're single investors, super funds, um, even high net wealth individuals, yeah. um, developers who are looking for cash flow mm. and they're looking for yields. Mm. What we haven't seen in the market is, is large institutional investors come in and say, this is an asset class we want to be in. Mm. And I think when that happens, the, the market will explode. Yep. But that's just because we haven't got to the scale yet mm. to do it. Mm. So we, we're working on that and uh, we see so there's a lot of opportunity in the future of, of being able to um, develop out our model. So you said around the tax problems the government's creating with moving to a build to rent yep. model. That's um, right. Whereas in other countries around the world, like for example, US, it's very common. You know, you can rent for life in one building mm. and you don't have to ever worry about the landlord selling it on you. Yeah. What's the problems that government's kind of needs to remove there around tax? And well, the two big ones are GST and MIT. Okay. So um, firstly on GST, our whole tax system is actually based around speculation and, and actually selling properties. Mm -hmm. So developers are incentivized to sell, not to hold their stock. Right. <laughs> so if you're a, a, a developer, we've obviously got the GST, you've got to um, pay GST, whereas if you're over, overseas, if, if you're holding the stock, you're, you've got to absorb that. So you're almost 10% worse off by holding rather than selling because when you sell the stock, you can claim back your GST on your construction. Mm. So one so, way would be for the government to say is to remove the GST on developers building holding stock. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that, that's one way they could do it. I mean, I see that build to rent, I mean, I've got a different view of it and people don't agree with me, but yep. I see that build to rent um, needs to be looking at single title properties because then you're not, you're going to be getting like proper build to rent where they are for people to rent longer term. Mm. I mean, you've had a look at uh, a number of players that have come into the build to rent. Uh, we'll say we're doing build to rent in Australia. Like there's a number of players that come out, some big players, and I won't name them. Murdoch. But <laughs> so, but Chris will. <laughs> so I didn't say it, but you did. But but take take that as an example. They've actually their whole exit is about holding for a period of time and then strata sell down. Right. I don't see that as build to rent. That's just a hold for a period right. of time while the market is terrible and you've got to deal with the the rental. Yeah. So so do you if, think that's a pivot strategy? It absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's my view, but mm. I think what what we need to be getting to is that over time we. They're single title or if they're 
poor build to rent, you can't sell them down. They are long-term rentals and that they can be held and, 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 and developers are incentivized to hold that stock for rentals. Mm. It's interesting and, because and, you're right. You actually are creating real long-term rental stock yeah. rather right. than for five years and then it could potentially all go to owner-occupiers. Or And also right, if the developer is incentivized to hold it, they might have to make sure the build quality is a little bit better. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, which comes back to mm. the discussion, you know, the Opal Tower yeah, and yeah. The mascot and... And, uh, and the latest yeah, one in Zetland. Yeah, mm. exactly. So if if developers are thinking we're we're holding these these asset classes, and coming back to, to speculation before, where if if in, if everyone's incentivized to sell, build, sell quickly, quickly, mm. move it on, mm. then it's about building it cheaply as possible, push push the cost down, and then what follows from that. Yeah. Um, so look, there's people they need to look into that. Um, and the second one was the MIT. So you what actually is MIT? A managed investment trust. So right. for overseas investors and big players coming into the market, you've got uh, you're paying a, a much higher tax rate, double the tax rate investing into residential projects than if you're inv- investing into retail commercial. Right. So you're paying the thirty percent tax rate rather than fifteen. 15% tax, but... Um, and I believe they were trying um, to do something there, that the Labor... La- Labor would... government would, had, uh, prior to the election, had come out and said that they were going to change that mm. and that they were going to amend that. Um, the Liberals ha- have not made any change or, or any mm-hmm. statement with regards to changing that um, impact, which is a bit interesting why you've got different tax rates for different asset classes. Mm. Um, but I, I'm, not a, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a... Uh, yeah. A tax expert by any means. I'm I'm just relying information. So I mean, people... and your background, you've done quite a bit of developments in the past. You know, lots of different yeah. types. What What have you? You know, just out of curiosity, what sort of type sure. of developments have you done? Yeah. So I mean, I started off um, after the Olympic Games, coming back, very little money, looking at how I can get into the the, the property market, and um, I think there was there was two ways I realised that I could do that. One was finding a, a partner, a JV partner that would invest. And that didn't sit well with me because I had very little knowledge. And so I didn't want to lose someone else's money going Mm -hmm. in when I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah. The second part was (laughs) the second part I I realized was um, I could actually option property. So find properties um, that I could go out, work with the landowner, give them an option fee, and then add value by way of amalgamating DA applications, rezonings, and uh, and then um, on selling that. So that's sort of how I... Um, got my start. Can you just um, explain the option process, how it actually works? Because we actually haven't spoken about this in 80 no, episodes. We haven't, have we? And it's it's actually really interesting. It's yeah. not it's fraught with danger, but there's massive rewards if you do it right. Yeah, well <laughs> my my whole whole part of that and and I um for me, it's about creating a win-win outcome. You have to create a win-win outcome with the owner. So in in all cases, in all cases I am looking at giving the owner more than what their property is worth. So I say your property is worth a million dollars. You've got your real estate agents have given you appraisals at a million, but instead of a million dollars, I'll give you say 1.1 as an example, but you give me 12, 18 months. And in that time, I'm then going to go spend money on a DA application, do the work and, um, and then work, work on that. And in that time, then I'm, I'm adding additional value. So they've got an option fee up front. They can go for a holiday, do what they'd like to do, um, adding the value in that time, and then and then on selling that. So, works amazingly well in a in a rising market, which we saw during that when I mm. when, when I started. But even in a in a slowing market, it's it's uh, very good because people um, have got that uncertainty and that risk about their their properties are, are dropping, and we can we can still go add good value and and um, in, into that. So you've probably. probably got more willing participants in a slowing market. Yeah, well, it was it was really interesting because in a in a uh, in a time of a rising market, you've got so few people that are willing mm. to look at it yeah. potentially, mm. and then every time you've got something, you can sell it straight away if you're looking to on sell. Yeah. Um, but the reverse happens in a, a slowing market. You've got heaps mm. of people that yeah. are willing to do it, and then very few people that are wanting to buy. So. For us, it's just as I said, creating that win-win win-win outcome, um, and we're yeah very much looking at at uh, now developing out that. And and um, I bought the uh, Katoomba Golf Club um, a few years ago, so that's been a pretty large um, development. 
I know I purchased so the old the clubhouse the consumer golf club went into liquidation in 2013, unfortunately, and mm -hmm. so that we had a, a master plan for 48 uh, DA approved townhouses, mm -hmm. and um and then the old clubhouse, which was a beautiful beautiful building, um, but was just vacant, and so um I bought bought that and turned that into a restaurant and golf driving range and gym, and now we've got a meditation center up there, and and then we um doing the development, and I sold some of those townhouse lots. Um, mm -hmm. development so that's just finishing up now um, as well but uh, definitely trying to get out of for me personally as, as well trying to get out of the resi I've done in the past um, and move very much into co-living got you so on your just why because you've got a lot of experience around the development side what were some of the things that you noticed where the reasons why we've got all these opal mascot things you know have you yeah. seen any gaps in the system that you think that you know um, private be certifiers plugged? probably yeah. You know, having builders with relationships with their private certifiers, so the builder are able to choose which certifier they use, I think that is a, an issue that needs to be looked at. Yep. Um, but I think coming back to this, it, people are incentivized because they're selling the stock. Yes, there's that seven-year mm. warranty, but, you know. Well, these, only if your building's more than, oh, under three, sorry, under four stories high. Yes, yeah. You've got a situation where builders are, are always incentivized to sell their stock, not mm -hmm. to hold it. So I think we've we've got a... Got to get the conflicts removed and, you know, <laughs> line it up a bit more. Yeah, that's right. Yep, that's yep. right. So back onto the kind of the, the co-living, I yep. mean, have you guys got sites on the go and how how big do you yep. think this will be in, say, a couple of years' time? Yeah, well, the, the sky's the limit, we think. Um, you've got a huge market and more and more people now are, are choosing to um, buy later mm -hmm. and you've still got reducing home ownership rates. So the rental market is drastically increasing. But you've also got a situation where um, a large number of people in our age bracket are, are living at home. So not only are we seeing a very, very strong pool of rental renters, we're actually pulling new renters into the market because they were living at home and say, no, now I don't want to live at home anymore. I want to live in one of these properties. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, really good to see and really positive. Um, but I, I see that this is an opportunity for like hundreds of hundreds of thousands of, of, of studios and, and, and mm. rooms a, across Australia and, and, and across uh, you know, even New Zealand and um, Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, I think there's a huge opportunity and, and um, because people are really crying out for that affordable, um, convenient accommodation. So are you looking specifically at saying, okay, well, individual owners or companies you know, it could be a company that owns a building, for instance, would come to you and then you take a head lease, or are you starting to look at other models for funding it? I mean, like for argument's sake, could people, do you foresee that people ultimately will buy a share in a co-living building and they may be able to upgrade within the building for argument's sake? I mean, I don't, I don't know, but what sort of visions have you got in terms of funding it and funding the growth? Yeah, so uh, we've got a, a lease model where we work with private developers. So mm -hmm. we, we start building relationships. Um, we're looking at a number of properties now in, in Brisbane and in Melbourne and expanding out into these other capital cities. It's still, so, but they're still, in, you know, when you say private developers, they're still only a certain type of person that has enough money, you know, effectively yep. to be able to take part in this. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether there are, you know, there is a vision for other investors to be able to, or to change in the investment class, if you like. Yeah. I, I mean, I think what would be really interesting to look at over time is, is ways that um, bringing other people into the market, whether that's company title, um, but there's all, all financing issues with relation mm. to that. So I think over time we will see that as the market expands, more players will look at how, how that uh, they can get involved in this market. Um, and I think, yeah, my mums and dad, it's not a mum and dad no. investor strategy mm. um, because as you say, you do need a lot of capital to invest into it, but there's still a huge number of developers around Australia, a huge number of landowners around Australia yeah, exactly. mm. and even, even mums and dads who own land, who have been sitting on it for a number of time, got a lot of equity in that land. They can, they can do a joint venture or they could, they can still get the development applications and we can still work with them in a number of different ways. Mm. I mean, that's the really interesting. So we work, for example, we're a leasing, they were signing up long leases and yes. then they've got funding and now they're starting to buy the building and then they're now doing like basically joint ventures. They're saying to the building, look, your building would be better if it was co-working. 
Mm. Um, it ticks all the boxes for what a co-working space is and will increase your yield from, you know, 6% to 10% and we'll take it out for 10 years. And then if you wanted to sell the old building after we come in, instead of selling it for 60 million, you will now sell it for a hundred million. And so we want you to pay for the fit out, which is going to cost, you know, 10 million. And it's kind of like, well, they know they've got a good value proposition. They know they can fill it with their marketing machine. Why wouldn't you kind of let WeWork and WeWork can basically, you know, take arbitrage Mm. in that situation and Mm. take advantage of the kind of the the building owner. And I think it's kind of the same thing in kind of Mm. co-living. If you've kind of got the ability to fill it and that's going to be your challenge, I guess, is just making sure you've got your marketing right. You then just need to go around and kind of find all the opportunities, I guess. Is that kind of your, your problems more on the supply side? Do you yeah, agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that that is uh, that meeting new new developers and meeting new people. And I mean, WeWork's an example because they got large institutional capital. Mm. I think if if we can uh, bring that into the market, then um, great opportunity. But you're looking at now a lot of big players. Um, particularly shopping centres. I know Westfields have come out and said it and a number of other players are at retail, for example, looking at how they can look at airspace over existing commercial buildings and mm-hmm. how they can... <laughs> they might be talking about filling the actual existing space they've got. Isn't retail really suffering? But that's my point. Yeah. So they're looking at putting potentially co-living mm. and residential Into... above above their retail precincts to create that integrated communities and then uh, building up that. I mean, for us, oh, it's so great. Not, re- not replacing the retail or repurposing the Correct. existing retail space. Yeah. So you mean extending height, bringing more people into Correct. to hopefully put more traffic through the retail. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because your shopping centre is only five, six levels. You mm. don't want to go shopping and, and and say, you know, I want to get some shoes and go up to level eighteen and then back down. So. Usually no, I was, I was wondering whether the shoe shop will become an apartment. No, well, no, probably no. sometimes you take out the <laughs> top level. But I know like yeah. places like Chadston in Melbourne, they're doing yeah. that. I know in um, in the city, you know, around the new David Jones, or well, the old building David Jones, mm. um, there's it's it's beautiful old heritage building, but there's you're right, there's all this airspace above it mm. that mm. is just empty that could be made into amazing commercial or residential. Yeah. And so, but you've got to make it quite cool. So they've made this kind of amazing beehive kind of development above the old David Jones. So, yeah. you know, you're right. Like that's kind of the opportunity for a lot of these companies is how do we kind of make, get better yield? How do we maximize our returns on this asset? And that's right. kind of co-living is one of those options. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do. Dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress. Mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Ed, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. I guess you property dumbos are always good to start at the beginning. And uh, yeah. Oh, I, no, we like to work up to them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, what I mean by that is the beginning of my Someone's sort of, journey. Of my journey. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, I remember the first property we I actually bought with a, a friend in Lismore. Um, it was I think we bought it for two hundred and sixty thousand. It was returning four fifty a week. We thought, oh, this is a great yield, great return, and um, we 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 bought it. And it was a Queenslander, and <laughs> they had a, a a property up, um, you know, four bedroom house, and then uh, underneath there was um, you know, a little studio. And we bought it thinking because there were two separate tenancies, and that was great. But very quickly, the after we bought it, the the council told us that that studio underneath was illegal and shouldn't be there. I've got to get rid of it, and <laughs> uh, and and then so that reduced our yield. And you didn't know yield. that before and you bought it. No, we didn't. No. We didn't know that before we bought it. But uh, that that's okay. But I, I think that's what a great Dumbo, what, I love it. Uh, <laughs> Did you actually but, go and look at it? Um, yeah, we had a look at it. We had a look yeah. at it. Um, but I think what's more important than that is is really. I mean, the lesson you could take out of that is that I guess you should be check with the council of all of that. But I think 100%. the better lesson was actually that the way I see real estate is that real estate, investing in real estate is like just jumping through a series of flaming hoops. There's always problems. You've got <laughs> dealing with councils, you've got dealing with, you know, you're doing renovations, maybe going into a tough negotiation um, when you're buying a property or selling a property. I mean, it's, there's so many issues with, with re- investing in real estate. It's about how you, are able to cope with those issues and the learnings along the way. So in the end of the day, I think we made $3,000 when we sold that property each. Um, we owned it for five years or three years or something. And, and um, uh, But I look back and you say, 
the time we spent on that property was nowhere near worth that. But the <laughs> learnings we got, yeah, the learnings we got off that mm. and the process we went through, that was priceless. Mm. And that's yep. things we've we implemented. And when I look at it, it's, it's, you know, you're never too, too old or too young to get into the market and, and start looking at it. And one of the great things about property is it's in, within your control. You're not investing in the stock market where you're hoping some CEO delivers for you and, and the people, the company delivers for you and you're mm. taking a mm. punt. Property is directly within your control. It's an asset class that if you can solve the problems and jump through the flaming hoops, then mm. you can, uh, then you can effectively um, generate a profit over a long period of time. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Good. So you've con you've taken a, uh, you haven't ended up too bad, right? You've got your money back, um, you know, and you've, but you've maybe well, lost five cost. years. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, technically <laughs> maybe not, but what you've done is you've thought about it. You've taken your learnings and you've got to apply those learnings for your benefit into other things. Right. Unfortunately though, most property investors just don't ever get the learnings from it. And they, what mm. they'll do is they'll just rule out buying another property. And that's why, you know, 85% of property investors have one property Yes, is because mm. they stuff it up. Yeah, And, you know, because if they didn't stuff it up, they would go, oh, that works. But everyone might... stuffs it up. Like yeah. I stuff it up now. We, yeah. You know, you stuff it up. It's, it's, a, it's about the journey and going on that journey. Yeah. And it, but so. those people, you know, could, if they reframed it, learnt why they made a mistake, mm. you know, mm. thought maybe there was a better option. You know, hindsight's an easy thing, you know, but if they could, they would maybe sell that property and buy one other good one. But a yeah. lot of people buy one property. It doesn't really work. Yeah. They don't buy another one. They just hold on to this poor property and then just hope that magically it'll all well, kind of turn around. Turn around. Yeah, but also you got to remember with property, sometimes these mistakes when you stuff it up, um, then you can't recover financially. Mm. So if you don't True. have the the wherewithal or the earnings or, or other assets or whatever, to actually dust yourself off, learn your lessons and get on with it, um, you can't recover. And yeah. and I think that that's the importance. And it's one of the things that we talk about, you know, with the elephant in the room when we, we want to, while we do a Dumbo every episode, because because we want to, the cautionary tale so that, that people can understand the risks yeah. before jumping in head first. And you're obviously an entrepreneurial character um, and you have learnt from that, and taken that, and I think that's fantastic to look at it that way. I've I've made plenty of mistakes as well. Let mm -hmm. me tell you, and I've learned from it. And my clients get the benefit of those those lessons that I've learned. But the dangers out there for individuals who, um, particularly if they're you know being sold to by spruikers or you know, there's a lot of mistakes that can damage people's finances pretty irrevocably. Yes. You know, so and I think that that's what um, you know yeah, and that's the what we want to help thing. help yeah. prevent. Yeah, so I mean, there's a financial cost generally for the bad mistake, and that could be losing X amounts. So, mm. You know, and a lot of the time that's not that bad. It's usually it just hasn't done anything. You know, it's just they bought an asset and it's gone. So it can go horribly wrong, like mining towns and things like that. Mm. But yours is kind of like a similar tale. Sold it for what I purchased for. It didn't go up, didn't go down. Yeah, lost stamp duty, lost selling costs, lost. But the biggest thing you lost there was time. Now you lost five years, but. A lot of people lose 15 years and then they're gone from investing when they're 40 and now they're 58 and, you know, they can't afford to buy another property. You know, they're going to retirement. They don't mm. want to take risks. Yeah, they take too long to recover, yeah, to, and to so, realise the mistake they've made and get out of it. Yeah, so mm. it's just kind of, you know, accepting that maybe you haven't done the right thing or maybe there are better options, but dealing with it today, not letting it just burn on for, you know, another five years, which you could easily have done thinking Liz Moore's going to be, Booming in five years' time. So, have you uh, looked back at the value of that property again? How old were you then? Uh, oh, what was I then? I was twenty-four. Well, good yeah. on you for giving <laughs> it a red hot go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, yeah. thank you very much. For, it's been a great interview. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, Cheers. really appreciate your time, Ed. Um, that's been rather enlightening. It's certainly a topic that we've um we've got close to talking about, or we've touched on with a number of our guests mm. over the last few episodes. Oh, our last dozens of episodes. So to have someone who's actually in that space come along and chat with us, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... We're just following on from our conversation that we had with Ed about his Dumbo example, which I love that example. Um, and that really comes back to doing due diligence before you buy a property, but also not knowing what you... or knowing what you don't know or not knowing what you don't know and how that can lead you to make certain assumptions. Um, 
But really, I guess the recovery from stuff up, it's really important um, that we do recognise our stuff's up sooner rather than later. And, you know, some some or oh, ages ago, I think it was episode nine perhaps, I think from memory, we did uh, an episode on really you know, buying lemons or owning a lemon, what to do if you have a lemon in your portfolio. And it is really important, actually. We'll put the the link in the show notes, by the way, for that last episode. But it is really important that we understand how to identify if we've made a mistake and to recognise also that there's a thing called the disposition effect where we are unlikely to want to recognise that we've made that mistake. Quite often people will sell good assets and keep bad ones. I've heard it described as cutting your flowers and watering your weeds. And this is a a real problem that a lot of property owners have. And and obviously I'm talking here about people who have more than one property, but to look at the assets that we have and to be, um, I guess, brave and assess them in the cold, hard light of day to say, what sort of calibre of asset do we have? So what I'm talking about here is that Recovery from mistakes is easier if we recognise we made the mistake earlier and we act on it. And I guess that's really what the boot camp is today. It's being brave enough to, if there's a niggle in the back of your head that you've gone and made a mistake in a property, and most of us, you know, we do know that. I think we do fundamentally deep down in our hearts know when we might have made a pretty poor decision Bring it to the fore and investigate and interrogate it and really check it out because the longer you ignore it, the more damage it's going to do. Please join us for our next episode when we interview Eliza Owen, who is a residential property analyst at Domain. Now, Eliza is a spirited, passionate economist. I know you probably don't think of those two words and economist together, but absolutely fascinating conversation all about property data, how it needs to be analysed, you know, what sort of data she has access to at Domain, the behavioural side of what property buyers and tenants do and how that reflects in the data, the lead indicators, lag indicators, all sorts of really interesting stuff. Like usual, we traverse an entire range of topics And I'm sure that you'll find it very, very informative as we did. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Resk. Editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.